Fidel Castro, faithful, a prophetic name for an extremely long-lived dictator. Yet, on July 31, 2006, Cuban television announced that the leader Maximo had been hospitalized and that his brother, Raul Castro, who'd remained in the background until then, would be taking over the reins of power. Since that announcement, Fidel Castro, the eternal warrior, has made only brief public appearances. December 17, 2007, in a letter read over Cuban television, Fidel Castro declared he was withdrawing from all public functions. A look back over the past 50 years, during which Fidel Castro was a thorn in the side for 10 American presidents and escaped hundreds of attempted assassinations and coup d'etat masterminded by the CIA and Cuban dissidents before going down in history as the most antagonistic compañero. Fidel Castro, Fidel Castro was a young lawyer, a member of the Orthodox Party, the Nationalist Populist Party that likely would have won the elections in 1952 had they taken place, but a coup d'état got in the way. He was a student leader in the tradition of other generations of Latin American students, but this was a political generation. When Batista seized power, only the Federation of University Students took any action. The others, the unions, etc., all kept silent. Then later, Fidel Castro took an important step. He appealed to the Supreme Court to condemn the military coup d'état. They didn't. So his thinking was, since an illegitimate military coup wasn't condemned, then insurrection itself is legitimate. At the time, Cuba was economically dependent on the United States. It's simply not true what people say about it being an underdeveloped country. Just the opposite. In the 1920s, with prohibition in the United States, Havana became a favorite vacation spot. Havana became known as America's brothel. La mafia aux États-Unis était très importante. The mafia in the US was very powerful and ran casinos, gambling joints, brothels where the American bourgeoisie came to have some fun. Batista was in tight with the mafiosi and made money off the drug traffic, prostitution, the casinos, which were mainly concentrated in Havana. The rest of the country was more or less protected I don't think the Mafia was the defining characteristic of Batista's dictatorship. Corruption was just one aspect. I would put the accent more on his repression, on the fear that reigned, and on the incapacity of Batista's regime to achieve economic and political independence for the country. What was the situation in Cuba like in economic, sociological, political terms before 1959? There's a subject of endless debate. 
Some groups, mainly in exile, maintain that Cuba enjoyed a certain development before 1959, that it was not poverty-stricken and illiterate, as the castres claimed. I think it's fair to say that, at the time, Cuba fit the accepted definition of an underdeveloped country, because you had one city, the capital, that was a sort of bridgehead, and it was less than 200 kilometers from the American coast, and it was quite advanced. But if you left the capital, you found a poverty-stricken population, isolated, and whose economy was structurally imbalanced as it was based on sugar and depended on the goodwill of the United States. After all, it was the American Congress that fixed the sugar quotas on Cuban production. It was an extremely inequitable regime. There was a privileged class of large plantation owners who held power, and the rest of the population, the majority of them blacks, struggled. There was a significant white minority that formed the middle class. It worked simply because Batista controlled the army and the police, which had an extensive network of spies and informers, and controlled just about all the districts. I think the conditions at that time were ripe to set the plane in flames, to use the well-known expression, because the economic, social and political contradictions were explosive. That's when Fidel Castro arrived on the scene. In Santiago, a lot of weapons were stored at the Moncada barracks. Fidel Castro and his gang of friends he recruited, anyone who was thirsty for adventure, for it was an adventure, decided to attack the barracks. It was a total fiasco. Raul Castro managed to escape. Fidel was taken prisoner. Fidel Castro, lui, est fait prisonnier. La date du 26 juillet. That date, July 26, 1953, would mark the beginning of Fidel Castro's revolutionary organization and castrism, as it was the date of the attack on those famous barracks. Puisque c'est la date de l'attaque de cette caserne, de cette fameuse caserne. Thanks to an amnesty granted by Batista in 1956, Fidel was released. He went directly to Mexico City to join a number of Moncadists, as they were called, who'd fled to Mexico, the welcome land for many exiled revolutionaries. And that's where Fidel met a young Argentinian doctor, Ernesto Che Guevara, who already had an impressive background. He joined the Castro group there. A former Spanish officer, a former Spanish Republican, prepared them for guerrilla warfare this time. One evening in November 1956, 80 of them piled into a small yacht they'd bought secondhand called Grandma, short for grandmother. Fidel was impatient, and he decided to land three or four hours earlier than planned. Bad weather had set them back a day, and he went and landed in a spot where no one was expecting him. Two days before, there was an attempted uprising in Santiago de Cuba the capital of the easternmost province. It was supposed to have coincided with the landing, but everything went wrong. An Argentinian author who wrote a short story about the incident describes it more as a shipwreck than an actual landing. 
Batista's planes were waiting and bombarded them. Once again, many were killed. But unlike Moncada, this time Castro managed to get to the Sierra Maestra. He made it to the mountains. Two years of guerrilla warfare ensued. And Fidel Castro named Ernesto Che Guevara first commander of the revolution. Fidel, fidelísimo retoño martiano, asombro de América y tan de la saña que desde las cumbres quemó espinas del llano y ahora riega orequídeas. Flores de montaña, ahora riega orquídeas, flores de montaña, y esto que las hieles se volvieran bien, se llama Fidel, se llama Fidel, y esto que la ortiga se hiciera clavel, se llama Fidel, se llama Fidel, y esto que la patria no sea un cuartel. Se llama Fidel, se llama Fidel, Fidelísimo Retoño Martiano. In February 1958, Radio Rebelde began broadcasting. For two years, until January 8, 1959, Fidel and his Barbudos fought the troops of Batista with a good deal of support from the peasants of the Sierra Maestra. The peasants rallied to his cause as a reaction against the regime's brutal politics and the expropriations carried out by Batista and the large landowners, many of whom were American. Many of these peasants were the macheteros who worked on the sugar plantations. The revolutionary group soon grew to close to 800 members. After those two years, Fidel Castro organized his March on Havana, placing Guevara in charge of a column parallel to a second column, led by another significant figure in Castro's guerrilla war, Camillo Cienfuegos. Fidel Castro's guerrilla war was widely backed by the Cuban people who turned on the Batista supporters that remained after the dictator fled from the country. It was a vast collective and popular movement that swept away the last traces of the former dictatorship. Batista's army collapsed, and Fidel Castro organized a triumphal march from the east of Cuba all the way to Havana, practically on the opposite coast more than 700 kilometers away. Then there was the triumphal entry and the equally triumphal speech on January 8, 1959, the beginning of Fidel Castro's revolution. La Cabaña was a hellhole, an old Spanish fortress that had always been used as a prison. Immediately after they took power, on January 2nd, Che was sent there to take control of the fortress. Most of the executions took place there, at least in Havana, as they were happening all over the country. It wasn't only Batista's henchmen, sometimes it was totally innocent people, 
But the trials were rushed and they systematically gave the death sentence. How is it that the American government, which had traditionally intervened in Latin America, the Caribbean, Central America, didn't intervene in Cuba? Well, you have to admit, the outcome of the war would have been quite different. I think the American government was misinformed about what was really going on and also underestimated the dynamics of the rebel army and Fidel Castro's leadership and the July 26 movement. At the time, like many young people of my generation, I was initially for the Cuban Revolution for so many reasons. It broke with all the bureaucracies familiar to us. It also seemed like a break with all the political jargon that was happening in the Eastern Bloc countries in the Soviet Union. For us, this revolution marked a new beginning. Certain writers claim that Fidel Castro was already a communist before. I don't think so. He was more of a personality. He was a fervent nationalist with a keen desire for social justice. But there's no proof that, before taking power, he was convinced Cuba needed a, a Soviet-type socialist regime. There is not communism or Marxism in our ideas. Our political philosophy is representative democracy and social justice in a well-planned economy. Fidel Castro, ignore encore. Fidel Castro wasn't aware he'd become a communist or Marxist. He was initiated into Marxism by his contact mainly with Che while in the Sierra Maestra. The Cuban middle classes who feared communism and who were still in the post-war anti-communism spirit, influenced by the United States, didn't know it. Two-thirds of the estates and plantations, especially where sugar was cultivated, belong to American companies, to United Food, which explains why part of this Cuban bourgeoisie, the sugar growers, financed Fidel Castro's armed insurrection for a time. They wanted to get rid of the powerful North American landowners. Fidel Castro kept his cards close to his chest. He sent the dangerous Marxist Guevara, a foreigner, on a Cuban propaganda tour around the world, the Third World in particular. He waited a year and a half before showing his hand and nationalized part of the Cuban economy. Fidel Castro vient de jeter un énorme pavé dans la mare des relations États-Unis-Cuba. Dans le discours qu'il a prononcé, en dépit de sa maladie, au premier congrès des jeunesses latino-américaines, il a annoncé l'expropriation et la nationalisation des compagnies américaines de Cuba. Cette décision touche des affaires telles que la compagnie cubaine d'électricité, les sauts standards et la Texaco, dont la valeur s'élève à quelques 400 milliards d'anciens francs. Nouvel épisode dans la tension américano-cubaine. Les Américains 
Americans, who were initially pro-Castro, regarded him as a democratic revolutionary, but soon saw they'd let the fox into the hen house. The Castro regime was totally out of step with the general Latin American climate during that Cold War period. In the larger South American countries, you had regimes set up after the coup d'état in reaction to what were already being called populist governments. It was the end of Juan Domingo Perón in Argentina, and it was the same in Brazil. In 1954, Getulio Vargas, who regained power illegally, was driven to suicide. Confronted with the embargo imposed in the 1960s, the numerous provocations and violations of her airspace by the anti-Castrists, Cuba had to affirm her sovereignty. So Cuba commits a crime of lèse majesté in taking over the property of American multinationals like the United Fruit Company. Face aux attaques qui sont en train de se préparer, Faced with the attacks being plotted by Washington, the leaders of the revolution, Castro and Guevara in particular, started looking for allies. They quickly realized they were heading for an inevitable clash with the American government. So where did they go to find the support? In Moscow. The United States, the same United States, that had put Batista into power, reacted so violently, the USSR immediately offered its support to Castro. And Castro's regime gradually tilted towards the east in the Cold War. The USSR thought Cuba was a golden opportunity to establish a bridgehead on the American continent qui pouvait être créé à travers Cuba. We're already into the 60s. And that's when the United States decided to get rid of this dangerous character. President Eisenhower gave the order to prepare an extensive secret program to bring down the new Cuban government, the Cuba Project. John F. Kennedy took over the program when he assumed office. Cuba must not be abandoned to the communists. And we do not intend to abandon it either. Ils organisent les États-Unis. The United States organized a Cuba landing with a number of Cuban exiles, convinced the general population would join their counter-revolutionary movement as soon as they discovered they had returned to establish democracy. It made no sense, because during the first two years, the revolution enjoyed immense popular support. And I think all the historians and analysts would agree there. But once again, Washington was led astray by the misintelligence of the CIA and poor analysis. The CIA armed and trained 1,500 Cuban exiles opposed to Castro, the Brigade 2506, and landed them on the coast of Cuba. Their objective? to topple the regime. The Cuban troops reacted swiftly and repelled the invasion in the Bay of Pigs on Cuba's north coast. Fidel Castro himself led the operation. Without American air support, the operation failed and the 800 survivors were taken prisoners. Those troops were defeated in three days, a stunning victory for the Castro's regime. The Bay of Pigs, they would say, was the first victory over American imperialism. That was the slogan that spread throughout Latin America. 
The mercenaries were captured, and the affair turned out to be a military and diplomatic defeat for Washington. The botched invasion of the Bay of Pigs marked an important date for the United States. They realized that getting rid of Castro wasn't all that simple. As for Fidel, from that point on, he deliberately turned to the USSR to ask for support, which triggered another crisis in 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Nikita Khrushchev had installed missiles in Cuba. They weren't armed with nuclear warheads yet, and the American spy planes discovered them. A battle of wills broke out between Kennedy and Khrushchev. Kennedy won. Castro was furious at Khrushchev's decision to withdraw the missiles. For Fidel, it was a betrayal because he wanted a head-on confrontation with the Americans and to test the strength of the two sides. It was Fidel's megalomania, his recklessness, once again. At that moment, it was clear that peace was hanging by a thread. Shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. From that point on, the USSR avoided any direct support to the Latin America guerrilla movements. There was a sort of deal between Fidel Castro and the Soviet Union to withdraw the missiles. In any case, the Soviets didn't consult Fidel to resolve the crisis. They dealt directly with Kennedy. They did give him a little consolation prize, though. The Cubans could intervene in conflicts in other parts of the world. Many years later, the letters Fidel had sent to Khrushchev were published. And there's no word for them except madness. On ne peut pas considérer cela autrement que du délire. Il dit dans une des lettres... In one, he writes that they must launch a preemptive missile attack on a major American city. The following year, Castro was invited to the Soviet Union. He was more subdued and fell in line with the policies laid down by the Soviet Union in the sense of greater economic realism, contrary to Che's doctrines. The Soviet Union knew they had to keep the Cuban economy afloat, and at the price of I don't know how many millions of dollars a day. By a kind of artificial respiration, they sustained the Cuban economy, which wavered between all sugar, not enough sugar, industrialization, etc. And the army began to intervene in the Cuban economy. The army meaning the FAR, the Revolutionary Armed Forces. 
This Soviet drift from the Cuban regime, as early as the 60s, gave rise to tensions in the leadership that Castro had taken control of. Mr. Guevara became aware of two realities. He, who was so pro-Soviet at the beginning, realized that the Soviets themselves paid lip service to internationalism, but didn't put their anti-imperialist doctrine into practice in the Third World countries, which explains his famous Algiers speech in 1965. That was the day Che Guevara went too far. One could hear him backstage booing the Soviet delegates, and during his speech, he viciously criticized them and the Kremlin's indulgence towards the White House. Once back in Cuba, Che's trust turned to suspicion. When he finally met with Fidel Castro and Osvaldo Dorticos, the Cuban president, he kept his head lowered. Behind the smiling facades, the tension was palpable. Castro tried to make contact with him, with the son he disappointed, but Che looked away under the weight of the mute accusation. Fidel Castro kidnapped Le Che, so Fidel Castro kidnapped Che and whisked him away to one of the many residences he had at his disposal all over Cuba. A meeting was held behind closed doors. We don't know anything about what went on, except that the bodyguards overheard them yelling at each other, and it went on for hours and hours. Apparently, the discussion lasted almost 24 hours. You wonder when they slept. In any case, Guevara dropped out of sight after that. We don't really know if Che went to Latin America and Africa of his own free will, or if Castro wasn't glad to be rid of him, as he could put Castro to shame. Guevara knew he no longer had his place in Cuba. He'd been in Africa and decided to go back there and organize a guerrilla movement against Belgian imperialism, which was still in place in the Congo. Bestia fueron las hordas hitleristas, como bestias son los norteamericanos hoy, como bestias son los paracaidistas belgas, como bestias fueron los imperialistas franceses en Argelia. The attempt at guerrilla insurrection was a resounding failure. Dans les médias cubains, after a few weeks and even a few months, the Cuban television and press, especially the national and international press, began asking, just where is Che? What's become of him? What's going on? To get rid of the problem, Fidel did a nasty favor for Guevara. People still wonder if he did it intentionally or not. During the Cuban Communist Party Congress in October 1965, he read the farewell letter Che wrote to him. Otras tierras del mundo reclaman el concurso de mis modestos esfuerzos. Yo puedo hacer lo que te está negado por tu responsabilidad al frente de Cuba. En los nuevos campos de batalla llevaré la fe que me inculcaste, el espíritu revolucionario de mi pueblo. La lectura pública. The public reading of that letter was a condemnation to eternal exile for Che. Fidel gave him the 17 or 18 guerrilleros he needed to go off and fight on a new front in Latin America, Bolivia, 
et c'est la Bolivie. The Bolivian campaign turned into a disaster, and he was assassinated in 1967. Exit Guevara. <laughs> So Che was draped in glory, and Fidel could use him as a universal icon, an eternal image of the Cuban Revolution, forever young and ready to fight. Dying a martyr's death was the finest gift he could have given to Fidel. So in 1970, the country had no choice but to turn to the Soviet Union and to support and join the Comicon, the common market of the Eastern Bloc countries. This was a high price to pay, because for Cuba, joining the socialist camp meant they continued to be dependent on sugar. But now it was being exported to Moscow, not the United States, and there was no real drive for development and industrialization. Plus, from an institutional and political point of view, a lot of things in Cuba were copied on the Soviet model, which inevitably led to disaster. It allowed Cuba's leaders to make some real progress, especially if you compare the situation of the Cuban population and its young people with all the neighboring islands. The healthcare system is exemplary, the education system, and even from a certain point of view, the standard of living that was well above that of all the other Caribbean islands. There's the other side of the coin too, what we could call the bureaucratization of a genuine revolution, the absence of political pluralism, a one-party system, almost no dissenting views within the party, at least not in public, one single press, one single radio, one television, a totally unreadable daily newspaper, Granma. And then there were all these waves of repression to squelch pluralism, because the people really want an airing of different opinions. Sum up by saying that from 1970 to 1990, Soviet influence weighed heavy on Cuba. Of course, there was a lot of economic and financial aid, but politically, the price was very steep in the long term. Then came the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, when the artificial respiration was cut off. This ushered in what they call the special period. The support that Russia gave Cuba, that the Soviet Union gave Cuba, dramatically dropped. Cuba began to suffer from severe economic difficulties. It started sliding back into a third world country, something it hadn't been for 30 years. The country was a disaster zone. When we went to Cuba in the early 90s, we wondered how it would ever get back on its feet. Cuba had to relearn how to live from its own resources 
and that wasn't easy. The regime naturally took a tougher stance politically, economically, and on civil liberties. People started using the word dictatorship more and more, which explains the mad exodus. As soon as it was possible to leave Cuba, many Cubans demonstrated for the right to go to Florida, and from there, maybe somewhere else. And that led to the terrible situation of the Balseros. All those people who crossed the strait to Florida in an inner tube. Most of the Cubans in exile became rich, and they practically dictate the U.S. policy towards Cuba. The Cuban government decided to legalize the dollar in 1993. And just why did they do that? Because the exiled family sent money back to their relatives in Cuba. And with that money, if the dollar is legal tender, the Cubans could buy lots of things in the special shops stocked with goods you can no longer find anywhere else in Cuba. And the government pockets the dollars, thus bolstering the financial situation, which was extremely bad. Fidel didn't have the slightest intention of changing a thing in the socialist state model. But he did try to invest in tourism. He allowed private enterprise for certain craftsmen, for certain small trades. Little by little, two parallel societies arose in Cuba. One that used the dollar, and one that used only the peso. That went on until 2004, when they stopped the circulation of the dollar and found themselves with an accumulation of social fragmentation and illegal dealings, where the social pyramid, as the Cubans say, was turned upside down, meaning if you're a dishwasher in a restaurant, you can earn 100 to $120 a month. But if you're a surgeon, a doctor, an engineer, a professor, you can't make ends meet and you've got to find something else to do. As a reaction to Fidel Castro's socialist policies, Cuban exiles, often backed by the CIA, organize paramilitary groups. Groups like Alpha 66, the Cuban American National Foundation, Commandos F4, and Brothers to the Rescue carried out attacks and sabotaged operations against Cuba and the regime in power. There was no way the United States was going to invade Cuba, except in the case of an extremely serious crisis. It was not at all in their best interest. But Fidel Castro was constantly brandishing the threat of war, a completely imaginary war. And everyone is completely mobilized all the time in Cuba. Facing the constant risk of domination, of a return of the United States and the exiles, the Cuban people have been amazingly resilient. So Cuba has a sort of ambivalence. On the one hand, there's this respect for Fidel Castro, because he was the leader of the revolution, he fought the Americans to the very end. But at the same time, there's a lot of things the people don't agree with. This contradiction, these difficulties, will have a disintegrating effect on Cuban society. The younger people who were born in the 1990s have never known anything else but this crisis. So what's their vision of the revolution? What they see is not very encouraging. Leaving out the even younger children, the intermediate generation, the people who experience the dictatorship, are in the minority now. The others were born after 1959, and for them, Batista's dictatorship is a long time ago. What they know is a country that improved their social situation in the 1980s, before the collapse of the Soviet Union, but that's no longer the case. 
There are entire sectors of the population that have lost heart, and groups in the minority, I think, that want things to change. Apart from education and health care, there are a lot of drawbacks here. For example, we're not free to leave, to travel. You can't leave the country unless it's for your job or military service. The lesson that Fidel Castro and the Cuban rulers have learned is that they have to back up on all these measures and take a different approach. Today it's much easier for them to back up, because they have a new ally who's given a lot of help, the Venezuelan Hugo Chavez. Chavez appeared on the scene like Zorro. Chavez looked up to Fidel Castro. Chavez was elected quite fairly. And he will never forgive the United States for plotting to overthrow him. The coup d'état almost succeeded. Chavez wants to combat poverty, illiteracy, and the marginalization of large sectors of the Venezuelan population. Cuba is providing the doctors and teachers that Venezuela needs to make their health care system work, to implement a literacy campaign, and in exchange, Venezuela supplies Cuba with cheap oil. This provides some relief to Cuba, but the only way the country will be able to function efficiently is to get the factories running again. That won't happen without the necessary capital. Right now, Cuba is being kept alive by artificial respiration. Not the huge iron lung of the ex-Soviet Union, but smaller ones like tourism, oil barter. December 17, 2007, in a letter read over Cuban television, Fidel Castro declared he was withdrawing from all public functions. It is becoming more and more evident that there's a transfer of power going on, as Fidel Castro had planned, to his brother Raul Castro, who is also chief of the armed forces. Raul Castro will not be able to make the changeover to a democratic society. He's not a democrat. He may be able to assume power after Fidel Castro, but he won't be able to hold on to it. It will slip through his fingers because things will have to open up. People want a lot, and right away. And he won't be able to meet the growing demands. This figure is seen as the leader of a group known as Los Duros, the purists, the guardians of the temple of monolithic Stalinist orthodoxy. I wouldn't be at all surprised if he introduced a certain relaxation of the economy. He's already started. Raoul Castro se retrouve dans une situation où il va devoir essayer. Raoul Castro will have to try to improve the people's standard of living. That's certain. Niveau de vie de la population, ça, je crois que c'est incontournable. Sans doute va-t-il. He'll probably take some measures to open up the economy, maybe in agriculture, so the country has a better food supply. S'il réussit. If he's successful, the situation might remain stable for a while. But in five years, maybe less, he could get sick or... In that case, there's an intermediate generation we know. We know the Cuban leaders. There are competent people among them. This new generation won't be able to skirt the key problems facing the country indefinitely. Ever since Fidel Castro took power, he settled all the internal political rivalries himself. Raul Castro may be able to handle them on a short-term basis, but after that? 
peut les gérer, et... mais, mais après. Il faudra bien qu'il y ait des éléments du groupe dirigeant qui... Certain members of the ruling clique will have to negotiate. Je vois pas d'autre issue à plus ou moins bref. I don't see any other options in the short run but to begin liberalizing the regime. À plus ou moins long terme, déboucherait quand même sur... In the longer term, that will lead to a political democracy, which will also open the way for economic and social democracy. Deux démocraties économiques et sociales. Moi, je ne crois pas qu'il y ait... I don't think we can speak about the collapse of the regime. Events will not unfold in a revolutionary manner. In my opinion, there will be a transition, like in China. I think that would be the worst of all worlds. The Cuban regime would feel free to continue its extremely repressive and authoritarian policies because they would have stimulated economic growth to a point where they could return to a system of redistribution that would enable them to calm the social tension. Beyond that, you have the Cuban people, the evolution of international society. Who will be the next president of the United States? Will he or she have a vindictive attitude like some of the politicians in power are hoping? Or will he or she be conciliatory like another group in Washington recommends? Aura-t-il une attitude conciliante comme une autre partie de la classe politique à Washington le souhaite? Cuba's future is a scenario waiting to be written. Triste debe ser la primavera, para esos que se van equivocados, sabiendo que se encuentran condenados a vivir eternamente sin bandera. Se pierde en el rumor de estas palmeras, se pierde en el sinsón del dulce canto. Se pierden tanto, tanto que se pierden hasta el llanto de la madre que ha quedado. Si tú tienes corazón, ¿por qué te vas? Si la patria abre los brazos por igual a los hijos que pecaron por error, ¿qué es mejor rectificar? que ser traidor. Qué triste debe ser la primavera para esos que se van equivocados, sabiendo que se encuentran condenados a vivir eternamente sin banderas. 